This is a Fox News Alert. I'm Brett Baer in Washington. Breaking news tonight. Two separate sources with intimate knowledge of the FBI investigations into the Clinton emails and the Clinton Foundation tell Fox the following. The investigation into the Clinton Foundation looking into possible pay-for-play interaction between Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and the Foundation has been going on for more than a year, led by the White Collar Crime Division Public Corruption Branch of the Criminal Investigative Division of the FBI. The Clinton Foundation investigation is a, quote, very high priority. Agents have interviewed and re-interviewed multiple people about the Foundation case. And even before the WikiLeaks dumps, these sources said agents had collected a great deal of evidence. Pressed on that, one source said, quote, a lot of it, and there is an avalanche of new information coming in every day. Some of it from WikiLeaks, some from new emails. The agents are actively and aggressively pursuing this case, and they will be going back and interviewing the same people again, some for the third time. As a result of the limited immunity deals to a number of top aides, including Cheryl Mills and Heather Samuelson, the Justice Department had tentatively agreed that the FBI would destroy those laptops after a narrow review. We are told definitively that has not happened. And those devices are currently in the FBI field office here in Washington, D.C., and are being exploited. The source points out any immunity deal is null and void if any subject has lied at any point in the investigation. Meantime, the classified email investigation is being run by the National Security Division of the FBI. They are currently combing through former Democratic Congressman Anthony Weiner's laptop and have found emails that they believe came from Hillary Clinton's server that also appear to be new, as in not duplicates. Whether they contain classified material or not is not yet known but will likely be known soon. All of this just as we move inside one week until Election Day in what has become a presidential election unlike any other. New state polls out tonight show movement. Donald Trump, Trump has flipped Nevada from Clinton's column to his own. He's expanding his lead in Ohio, Arizona, Georgia, and Missouri. He is narrowing the gap in Virginia and Pennsylvania. Tonight, both candidates are operating on overdrive, coming up with various scenarios to a path to 270 electoral votes. We begin tonight, though, with the president's first public comments on the email scandal since the FBI's shocking decision last week to resurrect its investigation. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge starts us off. But in a new interview, President Obama seemed to dismiss FBI Director James Comey's decision to reinitiate the Hillary Clinton email investigation. But this is not the first time Mr. Obama has seemed to put his thumb on the scale. In a 2015 interview with 60 Minutes, the president downplayed the discovery of classified emails on Clinton's unsecured personal server she used as Secretary of State. I can tell you that this is not a situation in which America's national security was endangered. But the president has a stake in the outcome. As the State Department revealed earlier this year, he corresponded with Clinton using her personal email address. I can confirm that 18 emails comprised of eight distinct email chains between former Secretary Clinton and President Obama are being withheld in full. In her April FBI interview, Clinton aide Huma Abedin told agents that she notified the White House when Clinton changed her email address so the president's high security BlackBerry would not block the emails. The president used an alias for these communications. As FBI agents sift through a reported 650,000 emails found on a home computer used by Anthony Weiner and Abedin, his estranged wife, the White House dismissed questions the president's emails could be on covered. If the Republic reports are true, nobody knows what's on that computer. Uh, and I'm not going to speculate about what may or may not be there. The discovery of sensitive records on Wiener's computer could create real legal jeopardy for Abedin, who signed the State Department's separation agreement promising to return classified information or face criminal charges. Five members of Clinton's team received limited immunity agreements. For lawyers Cheryl Mills and Heather Samuelson, the Justice Department swapped access to their computers and in return promised to destroy them. With new confirmation the FBI is pursuing the Clinton Foundation, experts said the deal showed bad judgment. They've potentially lost the ability to gauge what it is that's on the new computer as opposed to what was on the old computer if they're going to try to show that somebody withheld information from them. Uh, it, it may be impossible to prove. 
And while we've been on the air this evening, we have just heard from the FBI, who has said they will have no comment on Brett Baer's new information about the intensification of the investigation into the Clinton Foundation. It's worth noting that when Fox first reported in January that the mishandling of classified information probe had expanded to include public corruption and the Clinton Foundation, Hillary Clinton dismissed it as a scurrilous rumor with no basis, Brett. We will follow it. Uh, there's a lot there. Catherine, yeah. thank you. You're, you bet. Now to another story about bad optics and the Clintons. It originates in the latest document dump from WikiLeaks, and it involves what many would consider a huge conflict of interest between the Obama administration and its designated successor. Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry takes a look. A top Justice Department official involved with overseeing the investigation of Huma Abedin is a bigger pen pal with John Podesta than first known. A new email raises conflict of interest questions because it shows Peter Kadzik gave Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman a heads up about her email problem in May 2015. Quote, oversight hearing today where the head of our civil division will testify, likely to get questions on State Department emails, Kadzik wrote Podesta. Another filing in the FOIA case went in last night or will go in this AM that indicates it will be a while, 2016, before the State Department posts the emails. The tip about Clinton's email production to the public slowing down was sent from Kadzik's Gmail instead of his Justice Department account, which would have been a public record. Now out because of WikiLeaks, which earlier revealed Podesta praising Kadzik, a college buddy, for representing him in Kenneth Starr's probe, writing in 2008, fantastic lawyer, kept me out of jail. Also out today, an email with more evidence Clinton's own aides had deep concerns about pay-to-play allegations at the Clinton Foundation when she released personal tax returns in 2015. Spokesman Brian Fallon emailed colleagues that reporters would dig into, quote, overlap between paid speech hosts and campaign and foundation donors that could fuel pay-to-play storylines. Fallon added they could be vulnerable over Bill Clinton's consulting, especially the one with Laureate, a for-profit college that gave the former president President, nearly $18 million over five years to be an honorary chancellor. Another email offers a window into major donors to the foundation who may want to collect favors if Hillary Clinton is elected. Even though the Clinton camp has been slamming former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort for ties to Ukraine that have gotten scrutiny by the FBI, Ukrainian billionaire Viktor Pinchuk gave over $8 million to the Clinton Foundation and last year was relentlessly demanding to meet with Bill Clinton one-on-one -on -one or with other Western leaders to show pushback against Russian President Vladimir Putin. A foundation official writing, I get the impression that although I keep saying WJC cares about Ukraine, Pinchuk feels like WJC hasn't taken enough action. I sense this is so important because Pinchuk is under Putin's heel. Now, Podesta nixed that meeting perhaps because the Clintons were sensitive about negative press involving donors. As for Kadzik, justice officials note he sent Podesta public info and even Republican Trey Gowdy today is saying that as head of congressional affairs, Kadzik is not a decision maker in the Aberdeen probe, right? Ed, thank you. Let's get more on all of this now from Andrew McCarthy, former Justice Department attorney whose commentary in the National Review makes some very serious allegations. He joins us tonight from New York. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. First, you listen to that, the breaking news at the top of the hour. Your thoughts on all of this as it comes together. Well, the thing that stuck out to me most, Brett, was it, it seems to me like the Justice Department may be in connection with this fellow, Kadzik, setting up an argument that if you email from your personal address, arguably after hours, that that's not a government record. If that's going to be their new position on this, that, that is, is quite a substantial change in what we thought were the facts of the Clinton emails case. Uh, with respect to the other new disclosures, I, I think um, it's, it shouldn't be surprising to us that the, the Clinton Foundation has been the subject of investigation. Uh, it's a little surprising that it, it, it kind of emerged so suddenly in that Wall Street Journal uh, report earlier this week. Uh, but I, I do think it's, uh, you're, you're always potentially making a mistake when you take an investigation that ought to be uh, looked at all as one and disaggregate it and the FBI has obviously done that in connection with you know putting the white collar stuff in one box and the classified information stuff in another box that's often a way that uh, things that ought to be looked at closely fall through the cracks so I'm glad to see they're doing it I wish they were looking at it as one unitary whole
You charge in this uh, column that the Justice Department appears to be holding back, getting in the way. I talked to Attorney General Loretta Lynch back at the end of February. Here's what she said back then. Who's the ultimate decider at the DOJ? It depends on how the matter um, comes together. But the decider of whether to go forward is you, right? Well, we'll see what, uh, what evidence develops and what facts develop, and we'll follow those to their natural conclusion. Does it concern you, though, that there is this perception that, a, that your Justice Department may, in the end, cut Secretary Clinton a break or do her a favor? You no, know, I think that with every case, we handle it in the same way. Whether someone has an interest in a case because it's interesting in the headlines or because they're personally involved in it. Bottom line, is there any double standard here? There's no double standard in this or any other matter being handled by the Department of Justice. Andrew, because the Attorney General met with former President Bill Clinton on that tarmac in Arizona, you say that took her out of the equation, but didn't stop her, according to your column, from standing or trying to in the way of the Clinton Foundation investigation. Well, I, I don't see how that's disputable. I mean, as far as her meeting with former President Clinton is concerned, she herself said it was a mistake and kind of quasi recused herself from it uh, and actually deferred to the FBI director on the ultimate decision, which never happens in any other investigation. So, you know, for her to say there's no double standard in this case is being handled the same way, even if we didn't have all these crazy immunity deals where uh, the grand jury doesn't get impaneled and you give immunity in order to get evidence that you can usually compel, which also never happens in any other case, I would say that meeting was highly unusual. But we're also seeing now that these wacky immunity deals that they gave were used, according to the Wall Street Journal report, to deny the agents investigating the Clinton Foundation case access to what was on the laptops of Cheryl Mills and Heather Samuelson. And I simply point out that somehow that case seems to have gotten uh, before prosecutors in the Eastern District of New York, which just happens to be the district office that Loretta Lynch was the U.S. attorney in for six years before she was elevated uh, to attorney general by President Obama. Yeah. It also happens to be the office in which she came to national prominence because she was named U.S. attorney in 1999 by President Bill Clinton, the same guy she was meeting with in the tarmac. Right. So, the, the immunity you know, deal, in part, the limited immunity deal, had a structure in it in which those laptops were said to be uh, to be destroyed. Uh, part of the, the news at the top was that they are not, they have not been, and they're here at the right. FBI office and are being exploited. We'll see if that deals with the foundation or not. Finally, very quickly, your thoughts on the president weighing in again today on the email situation after, in October of last year, what he said about it not being a national security threat. Yeah, well, I, you know, I must say, Brett, I think if I were the president and I had communicated with Mrs. Clinton uh, some 18 times using an alias over a non-secure email system and then looked the American people in the eye and said that I didn't even know that she had private email or that she used private email, I'd really stop talking about this case. Andrew McCarthy, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Like any successful businessman, Donald Trump is trying to close the deal on his own terms. Trump is hammering Hillary Clinton relentlessly over her multiple scandals, while Clinton is just is hoping and praying to run out the clock and stop him from making in inroads in blue states across the country. Hi, Brett. For the last several days, slow and steady, Trump's been rising in the polls. Now he's locked in and trying to push Clinton down in them. At a midday rally in Miami, Donald Trump seized on new WikiLeaks emails to accuse the Justice Department of leaking information from the investigation into Hillary Clinton's email scandal to her campaign chairman, John Podesta. Assistant Attorney General Peter Kazik is a close associate of John Podesta. Kazik was feeding information about the investigation into the Clinton campaign. Podesta forwarded the emails to Clinton's top staff and said, additional chances for mischief. On the day the email scandal broke, a separate WikiLeaked Podesta email warned another Clinton insider the emails should be, quote, dumped as soon as possible. They say, having a dump, we're having a dump 
of all of those emails. The Clinton camp argues Podesta was shorthanding for a document dumped to the press. Trump calls it another cover-up attempt, and in Orlando, alleged a broad conspiracy. It's just been shown that a rigged system with more collusion, possibly illegal, between the Department of Justice the Clinton campaign and the State Department. Clinton is holding a 1.9 point lead in an average of national polls. The GOP's standard bearer has laid out his victory path, choosing 13 battleground states, in some of which he trails, for a final $25 million blitz of new ads. Trump knows he must win Florida. With six days left, he's up an average of seven-tenths of a point in recent polls. In Pennsylvania, where Clinton had a 10 point lead in October's Monmouth poll, Trump's now statistically tied, down four points within the margin of error. Trump's called the poll rigs when he's trailed. Now that it's close, he does not want supporters relaxing. The polls are all saying we're going to win Florida. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. Get out there and vote. Pretend we're slightly behind. You got to get out. We don't want to blow this. For the last couple of days, Clinton's been escalating her attacks on Donald Trump's character. Today, he said she's become unhinged. Tonight, he's got a rally in Pensacola, Pensacola Florida. Tomorrow, it's Florida, North Carolina, as well as Pennsylvania. Brett? Carl Cameron live with the Trump campaign. Carl, thanks. Over the next five nights, we will bring you a special series of reports, How We Fight. Of all the duties our new president will have, none is higher than commander-in-chief. Given that, and with Election Day less than a week away, we decided to take stock of America's armed forces, how they're being deployed, how they've transformed in the past several years, and what challenges they'll face in the future. In tonight's report, we look at how the world is changing and how the American military is responding to that change, or is it the other way around? As our military has changed in the last few years, has the world revised its attitude toward us? On January 12th, 10 American sailors were captured by Iran's Revolutionary Guard after mistakenly entering Iranian waters. This video was later released, showing them held at gunpoint, kneeling before their captors and apologizing. It was a mistake. That was our fault. Not so long ago, the world might have awaited a response from an outraged America, likely fast and furious. Instead, the U.S. Secretary of State was soon sounding grateful to Iran. I also want to thank the Iranian authorities for their cooperation and quick response. The entire episode seemed to point to a new world that's been emerging these past several years and a new military. At other times in the past, I don't believe the Iranians would have dared to have taken our troops and to treat them like that. I don't think they would have dared do that. Four-star General John Kelly recently retired after a 45-year career with the Marine Corps. For those people that determine that want to be our enemies, they should be afraid. I don't believe some of the countries are afraid of us. In this new world, along with America responding differently, Certain countries seem to be prepared to be more aggressive. We're talking about great power war uh, with one of or two of four countries. You're talking about China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. I have grave concerns in terms of the readiness of our force, the army forces, to be able to deal with that in a timely manner. Weapons uncovered. Man. What do you make of Iran's challenges to our ships in the Persian Gulf, the Russian buzzing of our vessels, the buildup in the South China Sea? It seems like these are bold actions or provocative actions. The Iranian buzzing in the, the small boats, the Russian low flyovers and things. Number one, unprofessional. Number two, unsafe. We hope that we can deconflict these things, but it's not going to keep us from doing everything we need to do to fulfill our mission. Ray Mabus, former Democrat governor of Mississippi, has been Secretary of the Navy since 2009. The rise of Russia, the rise of China, and particularly in the South China Sea, ISIS, things that you don't, can't know what's going to happen. Secretary Mabus notes that the Navy has been ramping up shipbuilding. Another sign of increased military response. Since 2014, the Obama administration has been returning troops to Iraq. 
officially in advisory and support roles. How many more troops can Americans at home expect to be going to Iraq? If more is required, and I'm sure there will be uh, additional authorities and additional capabilities that will be required, I'll let our commanders see opportunities to do that. Well, we have undertaken some military operations, but the difference between war and fiddling around uh, is that if you're at war, you'd uh, better plan to win. James Woolsey, who served as President Bill Clinton's CIA director, thinks what we're doing simply isn't enough. The Obama administration do a bit, and that is a recipe for losing in, in war. If you want to be respected, every once in a while, when the circumstances are such that you really need to use it, you use the stick and you use it decisively. In responding to these situations, American leadership is imperative. It's indispensable. There is no substitute for it. General David Petraeus, former CENTCOM commander and CIA director, would like to see more decisive action taken in Syria. I have long advocated uh, a safe zone, indeed a no-fly zone. We just ground Bashar al-Assad's air force. You just crater all the runways. You tell the Russians that if you bomb our, our guys, the ones that we are supporting on the ground, the opposition, we are going to have to bomb your guys, Bashar al-Assad's regime forces. What's your sense of what has happened to the U.S. military in recent years? Well, the U.S. military is without question the very finest in the world. The question is, can we maintain that? If you look at the readiness issues right now, readiness to fight, I've heard the word crisis used. Do it again! General Kelly believes that not only is the military not properly prepared, but it has spent too much time enforcing social change in the ranks. We're really robbing from Peter to pay Paul. The secretaries of the services should be fighting tooth and nail until they get the adequate funds to have our military forces ready to fight. Everything else would be put on hold. We shouldn't make changes to military policy unless they increase lethality on a battlefield. Corey Shockey served on George W. Bush's National Security Council and is now a research fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution. I think our political leadership has actually gotten quite far from that. We are incorporating greater and greater risk into the operations of our military at a time when our adversaries are getting better at combat lethality themselves. We are voluntarily making the job of our military much harder. Tomorrow, the How We Fight series continues as we look at whether considerations of social justice in the ranks are hampering or helping military readiness. President Obama says the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is studying whether the Dakota Access oil pipeline can be rerouted to alleviate concerns of Native Americans. The president says he will let the situation involving the 1,200-mile, $3.8 billion pipeline play out for several more weeks. Protesters has, have demonstrated against the project for months. Last week, there were clashes with police and dozens of arrests. The Federal Reserve will not raise interest rates before the election. Governors say the case for a rate hike continues to strengthen, but analysts say the Fed wants to avoid any perception of affecting next week's vote. Many expect an interest rate increase in December. The Dow lost 77 today. The S&P 500 dropped 14. The Nasdaq was down 48. Next up, why officials in Cleveland are telling Donald Trump supporters to stay away on election day. Election officials in Cleveland are warning Trump supporters who are volunteering as election monitors to stay out. They say no one in their precincts will be voting for the Republican anyway. No one. Correspondent Peter Ducey is live tonight in Cleveland, where the World Series isn't the only thing that has emotions coming to the surface tonight. Hi, Peter. Hi, Brett. Democrats here in the critical Swing County of Cuyahoga in Ohio are not nearly as excited about Hillary Clinton as they were about Barack Obama because the number of Democrats requesting early ballots has plummeted 35 percent compared to the last presidential election as the number of Republicans requesting early ballots has risen 3 percent. This could mean a big shift is underway because in 2008 there were 16 precincts in this county which counted zero ballots for John McCain and in 2012 there were 20 precincts that counted zero ballots for Mitt Romney. Now, in 2016, even with more GOP interest, the shutout may continue.
In the past elections in 2012 and 2008, they didn't cast any ballots for Republican candidates. So it wouldn't be surprising that there would be some that where Donald Trump doesn't get any votes. However, it does play into the narrative that his campaign has been using, which is that the campaign is going to be rigged. Look in Cleveland, look in Detroit, look in Philadelphia, cities with heavy African-American populations. Donald Trump is trying to offset any funny business by recruiting supporters to monitor local polls on the lookout for voter fraud or suspicious activity. But here in Cuyahoga County, these concerned Trump backers are being warned by officials to stay away from the polls. I have been contacted by a few Donald Trump supporters that have asked or have told me that they have been appointed as observers by the Trump campaign. I have made, I've been made very clear that they are not allowed in the polling location. They are not official observers. It's only, the state law only allows certain people to be observers. So would be poll observers are just going to have to take the county's word for it that the election was fraud free if there are again a number of precincts where zero ballots are cast for the Republican ticket because if they get too close authorities are ready to step in. Brett? Not even one. Okay, Peter, thank you. Talk a lot about the U.S. Senate races on Tuesday night, but one of the big House races to watch next week is in one of the biggest geographical house districts in the country's second biggest state. Tonight, correspondent Casey Stiegel on the battle for South Texas and for control of the U.S. House. There are 36 congressional districts in Texas, and only one of them is competitive, uh, and that's the 23rd. In a state where they say everything is bigger, politics are no different. The 23rd district stretches from San Antonio to El Paso. It includes 29 counties, about 750,000 constituents, and encompasses two-thirds of the state's border with Mexico. I've delivered um, to this district in, in a level they haven't seen before. Republican Will Hurd is fighting to keep the seat he won two years ago when he narrowly beat his Democratic opponent, Pete Gallego. Next Tuesday, Gallego is hoping voters send him back to Congress. I feel good, but we're not there yet, and uh, we've got to keep going. The race is so tight, pollsters have deemed it a toss-up, unusual once again for deep red Texas. However, Latinos make up nearly 70 percent of that district's total population. Analysts say that could bode well for Gallego this time around, since that part of the electorate tends to lean left, and immigration has been such a heated topic this election season. We can do a better job of securing our border. People here are very in favor of immigration reform. We need additional labor. Gallego hopes to take advantage of Donald Trump's controversial remarks about immigrants. So there are Democrats all over the country running this strategy that Gallego is against Heard to try to say, even though Heard has not been with Trump throughout, He's a Republican vote in Congress. According to Real Clear Politics, 17 House Republican seats now considered toss-up status around the country. Races to watch closely as we wait and see how the balance of power now all shakes out. Brett? Casey Stiegel in Dallas. Casey, thank you. Less than one week to go before Election Day and the madness continues. We'll talk about it all with the panel when we return. President Obama today uh, talking about the email review, the investigation into the Clinton email scandal. Um, remember back in October of 2015, he said it was not, he didn't think it posed a national security problem. Uh, this as the candidates take to the trail, Donald Trump, uh, Miami, Florida, Orlando, Florida, Pensacola, Florida. He was Florida based. Mike Pence was in Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. Eric Trump in Ohio for two stops. Donald Trump Jr. in Michigan for two stops. On the Clinton side, Hillary Clinton in Las Vegas, Nevada, and Tempe, Arizona. Tim Kaine, Dubuque, Iowa. President Obama was in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Vice President Biden, uh, two stops in Florida. Bill Clinton in Sioux City, Iowa. Chelsea Clinton in Colorado and Wisconsin. Bernie Sanders in Wisconsin. We have some new state polls out. Pennsylvania, a number of polls out today. So this is the average of recent polls. Uh, Hillary Clinton up 4.9. Let's go to Florida. Again, some polls out today. We'll take the average on the four-way race, and that is Trump by 0.0. Uh, era Nevada, a new poll out by CNN has Trump up six in Nevada. 
Um, next we have North Carolina, and that has Clinton up three in the latest Quinnipiac poll in North Carolina. And finally in Ohio, in the four-way race, the latest Quinnipiac poll has Donald Trump up five. Okay, we've made it around the horn. Let's go to our panel. Tucker Carlson, host of Fox & Friends Weekend, Fortune Magazine's Nina Easton, and Charles Lane, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Well, a lot to cover today. Um, first of all, the email investigation, um, what we're learning, how it's being handled on the trail, and the impact. Tucker. Well, I mean, it's just a lot to unpack. There's, in fact, there's so much to unpack that I think were Hillary Clinton to get elected, it would be a significant problem for her. I mean, there's so many emails, there's so as, much information. As far as like a, a case to be brought against her coming up. Going into the next six months, a year, I mean, the number of reporters who are looking at this carefully is relatively small relative to the amount of information there is. And so every time you turn around, the Peter Kadzik story is unbelievable. The coordination, apparently, between government agencies and non-government agencies, i.e. the Clinton campaign and the, and the parallel groups around it, is astounding and it seems to me prima facie evidence of corruption but you know there's no time to go through it because there's another thing going on it's really bad and I can just tell you this the Clinton people are starting the numbers are getting away from her it looks like doesn't mean she's gonna lose but this is not going according to plan it's not going according to the predictions of everyone who's been watching this who also have a vested interest in seeing you know their own predictions play out it's moving in very unexpected ways and their behavior if you watch the president today on the trail invoking the KKK as if that's some sort of you know meaningful part of American society it's it, it, it's farther than I've ever seen a president go on behalf of a candidate ever, and it's a measure of how very worried they are, really worried. What about, speaking of the president, what about his comments today about that email investigation and considering what he said back in October of 15 about not being a national security threat? Yeah, I think um, the president feels like he has to come, like, thread a very fine needle, but come out in support of Hillary. She's got all of these problems without going on. Without obstructing justice. Without, ex yeah. And she's got all of these email issues going on. It, it's important to note that there are two buckets of email issues. There's the Comey investigation of her email private server and what he said last Friday, which is one issue, which the president was addressing. But there's a second itch issue, which are these w WikiLeaks dumps that keep coming out, which are causing a headache for her. And um, There's actually a third with the Clinton Foundation and, and the Clinton all Found of the... Yes, there's that as well. So, um, you know, I think it's important to note on the WikiLeaks issue that this is intelligence officials believe a Russian-directed uh, hack into computers to dump that and we and I think it's really important to keep reminding people and viewers of that that it's that Russia is behind these WikiLeaks dumps and that um, and, and and that if we were sitting here talking of if WikiLeaks decided to go after Donald Trump's tax returns we'd be having a different conversation so I think that's just important to put on the table that said I think Tucker is absolutely right that if, if president um, if, if Clinton becomes President Clinton we are going to see a Republican House conduct major investigations of her on all of these fronts. Um, keep in mind that impeachment proceedings begin in the House with filing charges. I think this time next year, you're going to be looking at a Republican House looking at ways to file charges against her. It then moves to the Senate where you need a two-thirds vote to determine guilt, and it's going to, it's not going to, it's it's going to be a cl close Senate, and that's not going to happen. Yeah, Congressman so we're McCall, have to, yeah. Uh, Homeland Security Chairman, talked about that uh, possibility today. We should point out that the intelligence community um, is of a consensus that Russia is uh, somehow linked to this, but obviously different groups have uh, pushed back against that. Uh, Chuck. Yeah, it's I kind of, I, she must be the first person in history to have to run for president under fire from both Russian intelligence and the FBI at the same time. I don't know if that's ever happened before. Yeah, the substance of what we're learning, though, about these investigations. Well, I think it is... It, it, the substance to me is 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 still the same it, it it's still we we learned nothing out of comey's letter except that they found more emails on huma abedin's computer okay yeah. well today we learned that uh two computers that we thought possibly were destroyed cheryl mills and heather samuelson's samuelson's were not destroyed, were not destroyed and are currently in the fbi office here in washington dc being exploited we also learned that uh they are going through anthony weiner's um, 
emails on that laptop uh, at a breakneck pace and that they have found some emails tied to Hillary Clinton's server already that they believe are new. Yes, and and we also learned that the Clinton Foundation investigation is far more extensive than anybody has characterized. Well, so what we know is that we are having more uh, dribs and drabs of an ongoing investigation coming out from the FBI in real time, which is what the way things are not supposed to be conducted. I understand that Hillary sort of demanded that in some way, but everything you're describing, if I'm not wrong, is from leaks, right? None of this is coming out officially. No, it's not being put out a press release, no. Exactly, and I think that's a troubling development. I also think what this is doing is distracting. It's totally distracting from all the things that are, uh, you know, just two weeks ago we were learning about Donald Trump talking about uh, sexually assaulting people on a bus. All of that has gone by the wayside, which is tremendously to his advantage, and that to me is the main impact of all this, is political, not substance. And where they're traveling to and what they're doing right. tells us a lot about the campaign. It does. And can I say something in the interest of factual accuracy? We don't know that the Russian government is behind these leaks. We just don't know that. And there are some people who allege it. Obviously, the Clinton campaign has an interest in alleging that. But as a factual matter, that is not known. Does the American well, intelligence community have no, that, that is not the, the, that the Russian government, no, that is not a certainty, and we are betraying our journalistic charge by presenting it as one when it is not. We don't know that the government of Vladimir Putin is behind this. We just don't. I mean, it, is it some Russian teenager in Moldova doing this? I mean, we just don't know the answer. We, we, I'll tell you what we do know is that as journalists, we're assessed with, this, with the accuracy. Is it true or not? And not one document produced by WikiLeaks over the past eight years has been proven untrue. So like, why is our speculation about Russia more important than that fact? All right, all right we got to run there. That's it for the panel. The Vice President Biden looking ahead to possibly life after January coming up. Finally tonight, Vice President Joe Biden was in Florida today. He was supposed to be campaigning for Hillary Clinton, but might have gotten a little carried away, plugging himself to be the next face of Ray-Ban. Her dad, her grandpa was from Scranton, my hometown, and her dad was from Scranton. Her, uh, her grandpa worked in a, uh, in a silk mill. So, oh, sorry. I'm doing this because maybe when I need a job, Ray-Ban may have me as a sponsor. I, I've been wearing these since I've been 15 years old. I don't know, but, but look, guys, um, you know, and she also knows that globalization hasn't been, uh, hadn't been good for everybody. He might still be there. I'm not sure. Thanks for inviting us into your home tonight. That's it for this special report. Fair, balanced, and unafraid. No online show tonight. We'll have a special expanded edition next Wednesday after the election. On the Record with Britt Hume starts right now.